Esther and Mark. Thanks, Hayley. Um, that was a very apt introduction. I, I'm very happy to see my uh, research getting used so actively in Orkney. Um, so that's brilliant. Um, right, well, tonight we're going to be talking about primarily about boats. I am, but boats going right through. I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction, both about motor dye and about Shetland Dock Yardy. And then I'm going to hand over to Mark, who's going to go right through Shetland, uh, sort of right through boat development from prehistory up to Shetland boats developing um, from sort of the Norse period onwards. So Mark's in charge of the slides. So I'm going to be doing a little bit of a sort of countdown thing of asking Mark for the next slide for my section. Um, so Mark, could I have the next slide, please? Just to start off with who we are, um, Haley's very kind to introduce us both. Um, we are here representing Moda Dye, which is a community interest company we set up in 2018. We'd both finished our PhDs with UHI in 2017. And then um, I was particular, Mark was obviously specialising in vernacular Shetland boats. And I was also particularly interested in um, both the um, experience of sites but also I've been doing quite a lot of work with eroding coastal archaeology and Shetland like Orkney has a massive wealth of eroding coastal archaeology and so we teamed up to create a community interest company that was focused on independent community-based and inclusive but academic um, research on coastal archaeology and maritime history in Shetland. Um, at the moment we run Moda Dye as volunteers and we've done a couple of projects um, with the community up here, um, a little bit of work in person and then thanks to uh, the pandemic we then went online and did a big um, project collating memories and photographs of noosts around the Shetland coastline and have um, are just in the process of writing that up now um, and have increased the number of known sites um, recorded by about 120. So um, very impressive with the Shetland community to uh, not leave their houses, but give us a massive amount of data, um, which we're still working our way through. Um, today, we're going to be talking about the, fo the focus that we have on Shetland seascapes and the vital importance of boats to any archipelago and obviously very, very relevant to the Northern Isles. Uh, Mark, could I have the next slide, please? Um, today, Shetland, and by definition, sort of Orkney as well, um, tend to be seen as quite remote. Um, obviously, when you start to set them in context, like this map here on the left, um, once you see that, once the sea is your road, then suddenly Shetland is central between Norway, mainland UK, mainland Europe, and the Faroes, and of course Iceland, when you get a little bit further up. So Shetland has actually played a really pivotal part in trading and traveling over millennia. And it's something that has been increasingly um, disregarded recently, and it's been increasingly seen as a remote and isolated place to get to and, and, and been sort of marketed on the back of that. Um, and this was something that actually I published in the Orkney Archaeological Review a couple, of, a couple of years ago, I think, about the same happening to Orkney, this sort of othering of um, sites that are, when they're now being reached by an overnight ferry and or, or quite an expensive flight, um, when there were sites that were originally very accessible um, in, in a sea-based culture. Um, the image on the right is um, a more detailed image of the Shetland archipelago. Um, like Orkney, it's a variety of islands. There's over a hundred islands in the archipelago. And obviously until recently, the main way of getting around was by boat. Um, roads weren't common anywhere, to be honest. They weren't that common anywhere in, until into the 19th century and certainly not on Shetland. Um, and it's very recent that some of the small, smaller roads came about and the bridges. Even today, the roll-on, roll-off ferries are 
as with Orkney, the key way of getting between the Outer Isles and the Shetland mainland. So boats are an absolutely vital but often overlooked part of archipelago life in historical and archaeological times. Uh, Mark, could I have the next slide, please? And just to put you sort of into context, now, those of you who are familiar with Orcadian archaeology, none of this will be a surprise. It's the same. Um, but if anyone has joined us from further afield or is less familiar with the chronology of the Northern Isles, um, we start off with the Neolithic around 6,000 years ago, Bronze Age, 4,000 years thereabouts, Iron Age around 2,500 years ago, Pictish around 1,500 years ago. Then we go straight into Viking or early Norse. We remain Norse until Scotland takes ownership of Shetland, and I should say for my audience today, oh, and Orkney, in 1472. Um, so for those of you who are maybe more familiar with mainland UK chronology, you'll notice that although we are very connected and the same chronology is happening, it's very much a Scottish chronology. So it doesn't have a Northern Scottish chronology. So it doesn't have Vikings in there, uh, not Vikings, sorry. It doesn't have Romans in there and it doesn't have Anglo-Saxons. Um, and then obviously it, the medieval period is primarily as a Scandinavian possession rather than um, connected to the mainland UK. I'm not going to take you through the chronology particularly today. Um, if you're interested in some of our other talks, which will detail us a bit more, we do have a YouTube channel, so please do check it out. Um, and we have got some of our previous talks on there, which do go into a little bit more detail on the Shetland archaeology. Um, here, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about the connectivity that runs through um, these islands. Uh, could I have the next slide, please, Mark? Just to start right back at the start, um, West Bow, which is on the south mainland of Shetland, um, it's, it's almost on the southern tip by Sumbra Airport, um, it's the beach right by the airport there, um, is the earliest identified site on Shetland. It's from the sort of Mesolithic Neolithic transition um, in Scotland and is dated to about 4000 BC, so about 6000 years ago. Um, it's a midden, it's got shellfish, seal bones, seabirds, cetaceans. It's from hunter-gatherers living off marine life. Um, there's no evidence of fishing and there's no evidence of farming. This, this predates the Neolithic, arrival of Neolithic farming um, and appears to be a seasonal midden, which probably points to the first settlers on Shetland, um, either moving around Shetland, which you would expect in a in a hunter-gatherer society, or actually potentially just coming to Shetland seasonally, possibly from, from Orkney via Fair Isle, possibly from Fair Isle itself, um, and coming on using, harvesting the marine resources and then um, leaving to wherever it was they were traveling around. Now, this is the earliest site we have by a, by a long way on Shetland, but I will add a bit of a caveat here because because of the sea level rise and the coastal erosion around the islands, um, we get the same situation as you've got with Orkney, except not quite so widespread, we're not quite so low-lying, um, where we've lost quite a lot of our coastline that would have dated to this period. So we may actually be missing some of this really early archaeology. So this, this is one of our earliest sites, but there may, be, may well be more out there that to be found or possibly never to be found that have been lost to the sea. So these travellers had navigated across from presumably the mainland UK, presumably northern Scotland via Orkney and Fair Isle. They'd navigated across and they'd come in um, and taken advantage of the fact that Shetland at this time was unpopulated and would have been very bountiful in marine life. Um, and so it would have been quite easy for hunter-gatherers to come in and live along the shoreline, even though Shetland's a lot less fertile than Orkney, for instance. Could I have the next slide, please, Mark? And this connectivity keeps going right through. I mean, this is just an example of, yeah, as it says, keeping up with the neighbours. This is, as many may recognise, a plan of Mace Howe. Um, and I've paralleled it with a Sketchfab um, 3D model of Punswater Chamber Tomb in Shetland, um, which is 
tiny by comparison. Um, you can see a raging rod in the back of that shot to give you an idea of the scale, um, but is actually on exactly the same plan as any of the Orcadian chamber tunes. Um, and Shetland very much keeps up with what's going on in Orkney um, through the Neolithic and Bronze Age. It's less fertile, it seems less affluent um, in that sense, um, but it is doing the same thing, albeit on a perhaps slightly smaller scale. Um, so travel and interconnectivity is still going on very strongly um, as these cultural links and trade links um, are established and, and continued between the Isles and between mainland Scotland and in fact the UK and Europe um, through this prehistoric period. Um, so you have to remember every time culture like this is traveling um, and I think we forget this sometimes if not careful this is traveling by boat and this is why it's so important to think about tra about boat travel and seafaring in this period. Uh, could I have the next slide please Mark? As we go through prehistory, of course, it wouldn't be Brocktoberfest, but that's a Brock, so, and Musa Brock is the classic. Um, so here we go, you just a brief glance at a distribution map, and you could have picked any of the Brock distribution maps. maps. This is actually Brocks and Souterrains um, and vitrified hill forts in Scotland. But you can see by the clustering um, of Brocks in the Northern Isles and the Atlantic coast that you've got a very, very strong cultural link where the sea is not dividing these, um, it's not dividing these islands. The sea is actually uniting this as a cultural grouping of Shetland, Orkney and Caithness. Um, could I have the next slide please, Mark? And as we move on, um, if this continues, and this is our first um, vis visual representation of sea travel on Shetland. This is the shrine stone from Papel, uh, which is Pictish. And this represents presumably ministries, the Papa, the missionaries, the, the, the Papa missionaries um, or monks coming up to Shetland um, who converted it to Christianity um, during the first century AD. Um, they're traveling across the sea here um, with their pony and their big cloaks on. Um, up to a presumably already in this instance already Christian site on Shetland and there's a lot of Papa names on Shetland where where the the Papa or the monks um, settled. Uh, could I have the next slide please Mark? And just moving through on these these representations um, We've got a couple of really nice scratched images of, on graffiti from Yaltov, which um, depict, we're now moving into the realm of either Pictish or most probably, generally interpreted as Viking or early Norse ships. However, um, especially the one on the right is quite ambiguous. We don't actually know what a Pictish ship looked like. So it's, it's hard to be absolutely certain that we're looking at something. Um, something Norse, but it certainly looks, they're both depictions that would look familiar as Norse longships. And these appear in amongst your sort of um, amateur scratch graffiti on the site. Um, so we're dealing with a period where these ships were commonly enough seen to be scratched on stone that was found in the excavations. Unfortunately, because the Yalsov excavation has been quite early, the dating isn't very solid. So these date sort of 9th to 11th century. They're kind of broadish, broad, early, late Pictish, early Norse kind of Yalsov uh, layers. So, um, but they do represent a commonly seen um, site on Shetland, presumably at this time of longships moving around. And obviously the, the famous dragon head prow in the, the one to the left. Could I have the next slide please, Mark? This is going to be my, my last slide before I'm going to hand on to Mark, but I just wanted to give you an example. I've talked through um, the, the early archaeology and how, how we have to remember that all of this interconnectedness is all connected with boats before Mark starts to talk about what their boats may have been like, talks about experimental archaeology and then on to the later boat development. Um, 
I, I wanted that this slide is a really pivotal change in Shetland. Um, this is in the early Norse period um, when we suddenly see Shetland connecting with Norway. Norway's only a day's sail from Shetland, but before this period, as far as we can see, there's no connectivity between the two. All the previous interaction has been between the main, mainland Scotland and Shetland and Orkney, rather than coming from um, the, the um, Scandinavian countries. But this changes very, very rapidly. Um, they start off in the early Norse period importing steer type bake plates from, from Norway. By, by around 950 AD, they're exporting steer, tape, steer tights to Orkney and then later to Faroe in the West Niles. Uh, steer tight is uh, soapstone. And you can see the image of the, of the cat pond steer tight quarry in Shetland at the bottom there. Um, and this was a real pivotal point for Shetland because this is the beginning of the intensive deep water fishing and the probably export of dried fish, like you can see at the, the, the top um, image, um, to the probably to the Viking towns. So places like Jorvik, uh, sort of modern York and Dublin. Um, and possibly even, it's been suggested they've even been exporting them, it back to Scandinavia. Um, and we're regularly finding this, this sort of, the impact of this culture right through um, the image in the center of uh, fishing sinkers. These are steer tight again, they're soapstone. The design of these, we can't actually date the ones in the picture. The design of these don't change from virtually from the Norse period right through to the 19th century. This is actually a really pivotal time period for Shetland and it kind of sets the tone for how Shetland's fishing economy is going to continue and how vital the fishing boats are going to be on a, on a slightly more commercial scale beside the small boats that we used on a daily basis. Um, and Mark obviously will talk to you more about the development of boats um, in, the, in the main part of this talk. Um, but I just wanted to reiterate that, that this, is, this is sort of the point where the fishing industry that's, that's still a key part of the Shetland economy um, developed um, and has really only flourished and carried on since this period. Um, as soon as we gained the ability to be able to fish deep water like this, um, then Shetland developed a whole new source of economic wealth, um, which between that and steatite, they, they were trading quite um, sort of enthusiastically with, with the Scandinavian world. Um, and this, this continued on sort of through, through the Norse period and we didn't um, interconnect with the Scottish mainland again in a serious way. Uh, until you're getting back to, to Shetland becoming Scottish. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to hand you back over to Mark and Mark's going to sort of take you back a little bit into prehistory with a talk about what the boats may have been that, that were actually behind all this development, um, the invisible sort of um, part of the in invisible enabling of this this culture and archaeological development. So I'll hand over to you now, Mark. Right. Thank you very much, Esther. <clears throat> that was a really excellent introduction. And so, yeah, to begin with, um, just like to look at um, early evidence for boat technology. But currently, there is no archaeological evidence for the earliest forms of boat travel used to reach Orkney and Shetland. We know that the boats people used would have had to have been fairly large as they will have carried livestock, tools, provisions, as well as crew who must have been skilled and experienced at paddling across what are treacherous waters. It's often been stated that travel to Shetland by prehistoric boat was relatively straightforward as the destination was within the line of sight of the next landfall. However, what people fail to appreciate is how dangerous these passages were. For instance, just crossing the channel of the Pentland Firth is hazardous as tidal flows can run at 12 knots. The advice to cruising sailors today is to only attempt this crossing with winds less than force four, that's 13 knots or 16 miles per hour. 
good visibility and no swell and a fair neap tide. A safe passage depends upon a good understanding of tidal streams. The whole passage from Caithness through the archipelago of Orkney would be tricky. I've sailed from Shetland to Kirkwell in a 21 foot sailing yacht. Even on a calm day, the sea around the sombre roost was confused and uncomfortable. Traversing the dangerous sombre roost will have required expert seamanship skills and experience and a stable seaworthy craft. Even within the relative safety of the Orkney archipelago, things are not straightforward. You often have to wait for the strong tidal flows that run between the islands to turn in your favour. These we call tidal gates. Once the gate is opened, you have a certain period of time to reach the next gate before the tide runs foul against you, which in the best case means you are paddling and not moving, or in the worst case, you're going backwards. It is suggested that Orkney and Shetland were settled using hide boats or more complex boats, sorry, more complex log boats. Currently, there is zero material evidence. And so only, only uh, an hypothesis is um, able to be given. Archaeological experiments conducted using replica tools from the period and using broadly similar construction materials may foster some broader understanding of prehistoric sea passages. However, this is fraught with the potential for bias. This bias comes from our current customary boat building practices and cultural traditions, which contaminate such projects. The only way to address this bias is to identify and acknowledge the facets of bias at the outset and throughout the archeological experiment, something which all too often is ignored. And to be fair, this is really difficult. However, there is help at hand through the Roskilde Viking Ship Museum in Denmark, which is regarded as the world's leader in boat and ship archeological experiment. So, were the first boats that traveled to Shetland made from wood or from animal skin? Both technologies are well proven. A few years ago, archeological experimental replica of the Bronze Age Ferriby One boat that was built in the Cornish Maritime Museum uh, the project was completed in 2013. And this slide shows um, the completed boat. Now, I always struggle pronouncing this name. I think it's Mogor. Um, the boat's about 40 feet long. And as you can see, um, you've got paddlers on either side uh, and somebody potentially steering, it looks like with a paddle at the aft end of the boat. Before discussing this archeological experiment, I should, uh, really um, provide a quick summary of the Ferry, Ferriby One boat, which dis was discovered on the foreshore of the Humber Estuary in East Yorkshire in 1937. Uh, work began to excavate the boat, but this was halted by uh, the outbreak of World War II, and the boat was eventually fully excavated in 1946. The remains of the boat consisted of an oak keel plank and an oak outer keel planks connected by a system of integral cleats and transverse timbers, which were laced together by you with this. This is quite often called a sewn boat technology, but um, I think it's probably more precise to call it laced boats. Um, the boats were rather laced together. The boat has been dated to between 1880 to 1680 BCE. The Ferryby, Ferryby boat one was the first of five discovered between 1937 and 1989. This Cornish archaeological experimental reconstruction project was led by University of Exeter archaeology professor Robert van der Noort. The boat has been tested in and around Falmouth Harbour, but would a boat such as this have been used to cross the North Sea? How would it behave in the swell of an open ocean? How easy would it be to paddle in a breeze or a lumpy sea? How stable would it be when fully laden? Would it be possible to carry livestock in such a boat? And so the questions go on. So now we're leaping forward in time. Um, and this is where we leave conjecture and we move forward to 325 to 550 CE 
Um, and here we have the early archaeological remains of a small wooden boat found in 1896 whilst draining a bog. I hasten to add this is a replica of that boat, it's not the original boat. Um, the find of an oarlock, a chipe in Norwegian, similar to those of the Nydam ship, which we'll come to in just a minute, in a minute prove that this boat was rowed rather than paddled. So that's a major change in technology from paddling through to rowing. The Hausnoy's boat's planks were laced together and the caulking used between the straits consisted of pine tar coated cloth. The frames were lashed to raised cleats. These cleats were hewn as the plank was thinned and shaped. This will have been extremely time consuming and will have been extremely wasteful of timber. Then we move on further into uh, the transition period in boat and shipbuilding technology. This is pre-Viking age. It's important and tells us a lot about the thought processes of the builders and users of these craft. So perhaps the pre-Viking age boats is this one here. This is the Nydan boat, which dates to 320 CE. And this one here, as I'm sure you recognize, is Sutton Hoo, which is an Anglo-Saxon ship, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Um, they were originally, with the Nydam ship, they were originally two complete ships and the remains, oops, the remains of uh, part of a third ship found in a bog in Nydam, southern Jutland in 1863. These boats were fastened with iron clenched nails and like the Hausnoy boat, their frames were lashed to cleats that were integral with the planking. Two out of the three Nydam bog boats did not survive. Boat one was broken up and boat three was destroyed during the Prussia and Denmark war. Boat two survived and it remains in remarkably good condition. This vessel was constructed from oak which was secured to the frames with lime bast cord. And for those of you that don't know what lime bast is, basically it's from um, uh, the lime tree and basically, or linden tree I think it is, it's the layer beneath the bark um, and if you strip that off you can then um, turn it into a cord uh, and that cord can later be turned into a rope. Uh, this boat is large at 77.8 feet, that's 23.7 metres, with a beam of 12.3 feet or 3.75 metres. Uh, during this period there's Roman influence uh, that resulted in a move away from using of softwoods such as linden to the hardwood oak other major changes were the introduction of a keel, a transition from broad individually carved straits to more uniform planking, made from sorry, tangentially cleft oak or pine, the common use of iron fastenings which replaced lacing and a change from paddling to rowing. Uh, the Sutton Hoo ship as I've just said was Anglo-Saxon, it was an Anglo-Saxon royal burial the ship was 88.5 feet long, that's 27 metres, and has been dated to the early 7th century. The straits on this vessel were no longer lashed to the frames, but instead were fastened by way of tree nails. This vessel had a crew of 40 rowers. Although the ship has a keel, there is no sign of a mast step, nor of fittings for rigging, and it is therefore presumed that the ship was only rowed. Then we move on to this ship down here, the Usaberg ship. Uh, the Usaberg ship was constructed again from oak and was probably buried around 834 CE. The vessel was 70.5 feet long, that's 21.5 metres. The ship had a crew of 31. This vessel had a keel and it was sailed as well as rowed. The ship was discovered at Usaberg farm near Tonsberg in Vestfold, Norway. The ship was excavated during 1904 to 1905, and like Sutton Hoo, this was an extremely high status burial, containing the skeletons of two women, um, the eldest lady being about the age of 80, and the other lady being about 50. The younger woman seems to have parental DNA that originated in Iran. It has been suggested that this burial was the resting place for Queen Ursa, who was the mother of Halfdan the Black and grandmother of Harold Fairhair. However, this is very speculative 
uh, and it's a huge assumption. The following ship, which unfortunately is a bit covered up here, that's this one here is a Gokstar ship. Um, this was another major ship burial, and I'm going to discuss in a minute. Um, sorry, I'll backtrack slightly. Um, basically, with this ship, there were three boats discovered, and I'm going to talk about those in just a minute. So this ship was found at the Gokstar farm in Sandar, Sandfjord, Vestfold, Norway. Um, this was a dual purpose ship uh, used for cargo, carrying and also for raiding. Much less lavish than the intricately carved Usaberg ship, the Gokstar ship is interesting because it was a truly seaworthy, powerful multi-purpose ship. And again, the ship was constructed from oak. So we move on now to the Gokstar small boats. The really interesting part of this burial was the discovery of these three boats. Um, the largest of these was totally smashed and was probably an eight oared boat, whilst the remaining two, the ones pictured in this um, slide, were in pretty good condition. The largest of these was a six oared boat, which in Norwegian is called a sexaring, rowed by three people, and the small of the two was a four oared boat called a faring, rowed by two people. Indeed, these boats will have been similar to the ones used in Shetland and also in Orkney when the first Norse settlers arrived. These boats will have been used to travel between the numerous smaller islands. They will have been used for handlined fishing, moving livestock to the summer grazing, flitting in peats and for visiting friends and neighbours. So, what material evidence is there for Norse boats in Shetland? Well, there had been a long local history um, of a Norse burial at the site locally called the Giant's Grave. This site was excavated by Channel 4's time team in 2002. The dig was led by Magna Dalland, and it was thought that the ghost outline of the boat was that of a faring. However, during my PhD, I realised that they'd actually been mistaken. Um, the boat they, they thought was the firing was, was too small, it was too big. It's actually a six oared boat, a sex ring. There was only a small single piece of timber section of the keel that had survived. And you can see the X-ray of it here with the fastenings going through. And it roughly came from this part of the boat where the stem, this part here joins the keel. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is interesting as it remain, as the remains of the ferris fastenings provide us with an indication of how the, this um, timber was joined to the stem, the keel was joined to the stem. I'm moving on. So timber and boats from Norway. Shetland was originally lightly wooded. Much of this woodland disappeared during the Neolithic period. And so by the ninth century, Shetland probably looked pretty much as it does today. So as per the other Norse colonies in Iceland and the Faroe Islands, there was a need to import timber and also boats. The first record for the import of boats to Shetland appears in the 16th century. Boats and timber were also imported to Orkney during this period. The boat trade uh, was centered around south of centered around um, Bjornafjorden here, which is uh, south of Bergen, which is up here. The Principality of Tusnes being the main area where boats were exported. A Scot, Andrew Mert, whose family had settled in Shetland, traveled to Norway frequently on business. And it is probable that he was involved in the boat and timber trade. The Mert family were a wealthy, extremely wealthy family who were based in Unst, Following the death of Andrew's wife, Ursula Tullock, um, Andrew received a dispensation from the Scottish king to marry whomsoever he chose in Norway. Andrew then went and settled in Norway and married a noblewoman called Elsa Tronsdokta uh, in 1590. They settled in Tusnes, and it is therefore not surprising that this was to become the centre for the timber and boat trade to Shetland. The Moat dynasty continued through Andrew and Elsa's son Axel, who became the wealthiest landowner in Western Norway and who founded the Barony Rosendal. Up until the 16th century, boats were imported by the smaller landowners, 
in moving to the next slot, or we can look at it here actually, um, in vessels known as scuda. Let's go to the next slide. These scuda may have been similar to Scudalev 3, dated to around 1040 CE, which was one of five ships found in Roskilde Field in Denmark. Uh, this vessel, Scudalev 3, was constructed from oak and was, was 45.9 feet long, that's 14 metres, with a beam of 10.8 feet, that's 3.3 metres. Uh, the ship displaced nine tonnes and could carry a modest cargo of just over 4.6 tonnes. Um, so boats like this were, were going uh, from Shetland, principally from places like Yell, which is the island below Unst, Unst being the most northerly island in Shetland, um, just sailing basically um, east to, to Bergen, um, loading up with timber and then sailing back to Shetland again. Uh, the boats that the, were imported back to Shetland uh, were imported to begin with already built so that had been stowed on the deck so you can see this is not a very big boat so they wouldn't have been able to stack that many boats um, to bring them back to Shetland. It's thought that what they did was they removed the frames from the boats and these frames as I discussed a little while earlier were actually fastened by trenels, um, uh, wooden pegs basically which could be easily removed. Uh, that had been marked before being taken out of the boat so they knew which boat they came from and whereabouts in the boat they were placed. Uh, and then once the bands or the frames were removed you could stack the boats one inside the other. Uh, and so a bit like Tupperware really, you could have more, more boats on the deck. <clears throat> the second method to transport boats was called unset up and that's in board form or component form. These have constantly been referred to as kit boats. This term is, however, extremely misleading as these kits were simply rough cut components that required finishing, fitting and fastening. And it took a highly skilled boat carpenter about two weeks to build a, set, uh, to build a boat in boards. And so an upset boat was definitely not a kit for the amateur boat builder. Boats imports increased during the 18th century when these boats began to be adapted for Shetland use by increasing the freeboard height by the addition of an extra strake. Boats were also being specified to be deeper, which gave them better sailing qualities. By the end of the 18th century, Shetland was remodeling uh, these boats until Shetland's own boat types evolved. Um, so I'll just point out this boat here. This boat is, as you can see, it's got um, four chiper. So this is a, a faring, or in Shetland, a fouring. Uh, you could think of these types of boats as the family car. Indeed, you've got the family in the boat. Uh, this is obviously a very romantic painting um, from the Norwegian Romantic period in the 19th century. Um, but it's very accurate in its depiction of an Osselva. Uh, the Osselva were built around Tusnes uh, and they're still being built <clears throat> uh, mainly at the boat building school, um, which is there. The, uh, also about Varkstaden. Uh, I don't know if you can see this object here. This is a typically Norwegian object. Uh, there's no record of these in Shetland, but this is called a fish coffin. So uh, they like to take their fish live to market. So when the fish were caught, they were put into this, oh, my curse has disappeared, put into this box, and then the box was towed behind the boat. And you can see these holes, basically the, the, the coffin filled up with water. Um, allowing the fish to, to breathe while they were being uh, taken to market. Uh, this steering arrangement, this helm, um, is Norwegian. There's no record of this type of helm being used in Shetland. Uh, there is limited evidence through the first fishing boat register of 1869 of sprit sail rigged boats, but mainly the boats, as we've seen in a minute, were um, asymmetric uh, square sail, dipping square sail. Um, so it would be the boats that were imported to Shetland, um, things like the mast and in Shetland the yard, this is a sprit here, uh, and the rudder 
uh, and the Shetland helm were, were made in Shetland. Although oars were imported, there's quite a few records of oars being imported from Western Norway. So this boat trade continued, albeit with a seven year break between 1807 and 1814, when the British blockaded Norwegian ports during the Danish war. This trade resumed following the lifting of the blockade and the boats and boards imported were numerous. The trade, however, began to slump. The main reasons for this was the Shetlanders were able to build boats cheaper than those from Norway. Uh, the boats being built in Norway had doubled in price after the Danish war. This increase in cost was also compounded by high import duties on timber. Um, it's important to mention here that most of the boats imported to Shetland, uh, it seems, were actually smuggled. So you could think for, for every boat smuggled, at least one other, sorry, for every boat that had duty paid on it, there was at least one other boat being smuggled. Um, Shetlanders, by, Shetlanders by this time preferred the shape of the boats built locally. Also, there's uh, documentary evidence that uh, the quality of workmanship was, was deteriorating in Western Norway on the boats that were coming to Shetland. And it was a bit of a double whammy, really, because uh, price. So the boat builders are being constantly, their prices have been constantly forced down. So they're working to ever tighter um, profit margins. So naturally, the, the quality of the workmanship and the materials being used um, went down as well. And there's evidence that for the, for the boat components coming to Shetland, um, a lot of them had to be remade once they're in Shetland because the, they, were, they were just not good quality. Um, Shetland merchants were also buying timber by this time from uh, purely for, for boat building from different parts of Norway. And so the old business contacts in Bergen were beginning to be lost. And indeed, um, in 1872, this trade was definitely coming to an end as this letter from Hay and Company to Alexander Grieg and Son in Bergen illustrates. I'll just read you this uh, portion of the letter. Dear Sirs, we received your esteemed letter of the 20, uh, 24th Alto in due course and note the contents, but we regret to say the trade in boats here has quite changed of late years and we are therefore unable to take advantage of your kind offer. No boats can be sold here now except those built by our own workmen. And we have to import square timber from the east coast of Norway for the special purpose of boat building, which is carried on now to a much greater extent than formerly. We regret that the steamer, which has been running the past summer between Bergen and Iceland, calling here, going and returning has been discontinued. Otherwise, one of our firm would have had the pleasure of paying you a visit and renewing our long acquaintance. With best wishes, we are, dear sir, Hay and Company. And I really like the end, <laughs> the way the, the letters ended uh, by that statement, we are, dear sir, Hay and Company. Um, okay, so moving on. So what did Shetland's boats by the 19th century look like? Well, I hope you can see this slide. Uh, this is a half yole or a period um, which is smaller than a conventional yole, which was uh, 23 feet over the stems with a 15 foot of keel. This boat here, uh, which is built in a, around 1890 uh, down in Donrosnes, um, is 19.9 feet over the stems with a 5.3 feet beam. And its length of keel was 13 feet, or is 13 feet. This is in the uh, museum, Shetland Museum and Archives collection. Uh, this is a Foreen Anne, uh, built by Lawrence Goodlud in 1899. And this boat is a typical 17.8 uh, foot over the stems, beam of 5.5 feet with a keel of 10 feet, uh, pretty much the same size as, as my boat, which I've got in the shed at the moment. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, the firing in the painting by Hans Dahl, you could think of that as the as the car of its day, well, the foreen in Shetland was the same. You could think of it as the car of its day. Think of it as, a, I don't know, um, hatchback or as um, a sports utility vehicle, something along those lines. It's it multi-purpose. 
in the top left here, we have uh, the market boat um, from uh, Picturesque Life in Shetland, um, published in 1890. And this, this painting, it's actually a painting, it's in the uh, Shetland Museum Archives collection. And you can see uh, the boat is being rowed by, by women uh, and it's just women on the boat, there are no men. And th th it seems that this is fairly common. If you think the men were away fishing in the summer and so the women were left to run the crofts. And so women using boats was commonplace in Shetland. I'm not sure if it was the same in Orkney, but certainly in Shetland, uh, there, there's lots of documentary evidence of women using boats. Uh, and indeed, uh, the first uh, regatta, which was held in Lerwick in 1880, um, there's a women's rowing team from Trondra. They were the only women's rowing team to enter. And so they were put up against uh, a crew from the Royal Navy uh, from the ship uh, HMS Eagle uh, and the Chandra women. Admittedly, they were in quite different boats and there were more, there, there were more women rowing than men in uh, the HMS Eagle small boat, but the women trounced the men and the Chandra team went on to win many regattas for many years after. Uh, this picture here on the right, top right, is the Papster mail boat Maggie. So boats were used for taking the mail uh, between uh, Papastur, which is on the west coast, just off the west coast of Shetland, to the mainland and back again. Um, uh, mail boats were used for, for all the islands. Where I live on Borough, there was a mail boat that used to come from uh, west of Corf. Um, people got married by boat, people got buried by boat here on Borough. Um, People went from uh, Westercorf to the church at Papal um, to get married, and similarly, folk went to be buried. They were taken; their, their bodies were taken from Westercorf uh, to Papal to be buried in the, the kirkyard there. Um, boats used for recreation, uh, and boats were used all year round. This this particular photograph is one of my favourites from 1947, digging forings out from under the snow in the Neustadt Stivler, which is on Yell, uh, to go across the, the Vaux to the shops. Um, and moving on to six oar boats. Uh, the six oar boats were a bit more specialised. So uh, this is a, a typical Dunrustness Yell, Yell uh, 23 foot over the stems with a 15 foot keel. Um, then we have up here on the top right, uh, a six serene, a six oared boat. Um, you can see both here, uh, the asymmetric dipping square sail. Um, th these are, there's a, a replica of this boat called Vela May, which um, was built back in 2010 by um, Shetland Amenity Trust. Um, two boat builders built it. Uh, Jack Duncan and Robbie Tate. <clears throat> and I sold this boat regularly. I've not sold it this year, but uh, up until 29, well, up until 2020, really, um, I was one of the skippers of the boat. Uh, and the boats are exceptional. I mean, truly exceptional. Uh, they sail really well to the wind. Um, I was talking to someone last night, you know, you can be sailing like um, this boat, the industry is sailing here. Uh, and you can let go of the helm and the boat will keep going and the helm will just stay. The boat is so beautifully balanced. Uh, this boat down here is a haddock boat. You can see this has got a slightly different rig. Um, uh, boats from Warsaw during this period started to have rigs called Ela rigs. So this basically is a standing lug rig uh, with a jib, uh, which is much easier to handle. And it's got a loose footed uh, mainsail. So no boom, none of these boats have got booms. Um, uh, the Haddock boat was a smaller version basically of the Six Arene. Um, and the Yol is a separate uh, genre altogether. It's, it's quite a different boat. You can think of the Yol more like a missile really um, in its shape. It's, uh, it's much more streamlined. Uh, these boats are, are bigger. Um, the industry here had a, has a keel of 20 feet, so it's 30 feet over the stems. 
and this haddock boat here looks like it's got a keel of about 13 foot which would make it about 20 21 feet over the stems boats by the as i said the first Loic regatta was in 1880 and following on from that regatta um, recreational sailing became more and more popular uh, and this is a, a as, as Esther was saying, uh, saying earlier on, there were no roads in Shetland until quite late. Uh, roads began to be built in Shetland in 1840. Um, and up until then, you had to go by a boat, really. You could walk over, th over tracks, but, you know, it, to be serious, you, you really wanted to go if you could by boat. Um, and it's just a turnaround. This is <laughs> a t very, very good example of the turnaround from, from um, everything going by sea to the boat being taken by road to the regatta um, on this Model T Ford. Uh, this photograph up here is an important photograph and that's because of this boat here, the green one with the pink sail. Um, this boat here is called Maid of Thule and this was the first of the Maid class boats. Most of the boats at this time were ballasted boats like these ones here, much bigger, and they had lead ballast in them and they also had lead shifting ballast. So the poor person at the f in the middle here, uh, when the boat uh, changed direction, they would have to move the ballast from the windward side uh, back on onto the new windward side um, by hand. So um, it was heavy work. Um, so then these smaller boats, uh, the maids were created by a chap called Duncan Sanderson, who sadly died last year. He, I think he, Duncan was, was he 95, I think? Um, and he was one, also the founder of the Unst Boat Haven. So uh, the maid, uh, he wanted to sail because his wife uh, was very keen on sailing and she wouldn't be able to handle a ballast on, on a ballasted boat. So he used a, a boat that was lying around, became hugely successful uh, and won the Interclub. And then we're leaping forward. This is pretty much the end of the presentation now. We're leaping forward to um, the 21st century. And this is a modern maid as they are today. Um, the, these boats are, are um, plywood uh, and they're made using epoxy glue. And as you can see, this is a very high tech sail um, with carbon fiber in it. So that's where we've come to today. Okay, that's kind of it. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed, Mark, for sharing um, and Esther for that presentation, which has been absolutely fascinating. And if nothing else, certainly makes me think that I'd love to get out in a boat sometime soon. Um, so thank you so much. Thanks very much for that. We've had one question in the chat already, if we're okay to, to take a question. And that was a question from David that came up partway through your section, the talk, Mark, um, where David said, uh, what's the difference as mentioned by Mark between, I'm guessing that should be paddling and rowing. Okay, yeah, so paddling, <clears throat> basically you have a paddle and you lean over the side of the boat and, and paddle. Whereas with rowing, it, you have um, oar locks, um, which in Shetland we call them uh, caves. In Norway, they're chiper. Um, and down south, we'd call them orlocks, basically, or rollocks, uh, um, something for the oar to pivot in. And so um, basically, you're pulling yourself through the water with the oars. And on smaller boats, on the far rings, sexer rings, um, you would have a pair of oars. So you'd have an oar in each hand uh, and you would row. Whereas with paddling, you just have one paddle and there'll be two of you on either side of the boat paddling. Otherwise you'd go around in circles. I hope that's answered the question okay. Super, thanks. Thanks, Mark. We've had another question from Hilary. Um, what is your favorite artifact that you have found in your research? Maybe if you could pick that one up first, Mark, and then maybe Esther, if you'd like to, to come in on that one as well. Oh gosh, that's really difficult actually. Um, there's so many. I suppose for me, it's the boats. Uh, the boats are the artifacts, you know, uh, they're really important material cultural objects and 
doing my PhD, I came across a boat which had been lying in a shed and um, it was owned by a chap called Tommy Eisbister who lives on my neighboring island, um, Trondra. Uh, and Tommy, I went to see Tommy uh, and he showed me this boat. And this boat was remarkable because it was pretty, it was built in the 1880s. And apart from the top strake um, was original, including fastenings. And that boat had many features uh, which were West Norwegian. Um, so, it was a, so it had like molded beats, um, which we've not had time to talk about really, but it had molded beats on each of the strakes and each of the planks. And also it had a peculiar forward facing scare. So um, normally on, in boat building, uh, when you join two pieces of timber together, the planks, um, it's called a scarf joint down south in Shetland, it's called a scare. And those are mechanically fastened with, with uh, rivets, basically. And they always face towards the back of the boat. But in Western Norway, uh, around Tusnes, the tradition is for them to face forwards on just two strakes at the back of the boat, um, just above the house. Um, and this boat in Shetland had those same two symmetrical scares facing forwards at the back of the boat. So it had quite a few West Norwegian features. Having said that, I've come across a few boats in Shetland with the forward facing scare. So it's kind of a hangover from, from a West Norwegian boat building tradition. And nobody knows why the scares face forward. And if you speak to any modern boat builder, they'll tell you that's an error. The boat builder obviously made an error and decided to cover it up by just having the other one exactly the same on the other mm -hmm. side of the boat. But the fact is that the boats in Norway, the Ursula, um, you know, they, that boat building tradition goes way back and they've always been built with the scares facing forward. So that's probably my favorite. Sorry, I hope that's yeah, answered. No, that's great. Then. That's fantastic, thank you. Esther, have you got your favorite artifact? That is a really hard question, <laughs> especially to ask an archeologist. <laughs> it's, it's like, there's quite a few, but um, I guess, uh, I guess I'm going to say, although it is really, really tricky, I'm going to go for a Shetland one. Obviously, I didn't start out my career on Shetland, so, but I'm going to go for a Shetland one. And I'm going to say, I think the, to keep it in keeping with Brocktoberfest, I'm going to say when we were excavating um, Chanowick, which was a brock that was, well, it was a brock we didn't know was a brock. It was eroding, uh, an eroding coastal site that we didn't know what it was uh, in 2015. And that was an amazing site itself. And I think that has been one of my favorites. The artifact, I, I'm gonna cheat and have two artifacts. So two artifacts I'm gonna pick are one was a Pictish bone toggle that we actually, we were cleaning back the section on the first, on one day and found half of it. And we're cleaning back the section on the second day and found the other half. Um, and you literally could have basically just glued it together and used it now. It was a perfect little bone toggle, just the kind of thing you would get on a duffel coat when you were a kid, um, but a Pictish one. Um, but we also found at Chanowick, when the Pictish wheelhouse that was built inside the Brock was um, abandoned, it must have had a, a standing loom abandoned in situ um, because mm -hmm. the loom weights just kept dropping out of the section as it eroded back. We were getting, we got, we've like, oh, we've got a loom weight, brilliant. And then as we were monitoring the site after we'd finished, and as we were monitoring the erosion, we were getting them just dropping as it was eroding. And we suddenly realized that actually what we had was obviously a, had been a loop. Um, and gradually the weights were just, just coming out of the section, but that was a great site. Um, it was, we also found a, the, the reason, the first, uh, first confirmation we got that we were actually dealing with a brock um, was when we lit, practically literally stumbled on a Brock well. We did, this is the only time in my career and I've been working, I've been sort of involved in working in archeology span for like scary length of time, 20 odd years now. And um, it's the only time I've done that classic thing that you think of all archeologists do as a kid, where you shine a torch into a hole in some stonework and see a void. And mm -hmm. for once in my life, it actually was something <laughs> as opposed to just being the inside of a dry stone wall. Um, and that was how we discovered a corbelled brock well um, coming out of the That's section it. of the, of the, and if anyone's interested in that, just Google um, Chanowick brock. So Chanowick is C-H-A-N-N-E-R wick. 
bulk um and um or and you'll you'll see their photos and things it was an excavation with um the skate trust in in 2015 up here um but yeah so i think i think that 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 site definitely qualifies as my my favorite show on site Super, that's fantastic. And that links really nicely back to the talk that we had from Amber earlier on this week, which was about looms um, and the sort of typology of, of looms and that she's doing in her research at the moment. So um, if any of you who are on the call missed that, then that is on our YouTube channel. We didn't plan that, it's just simply there. That's a good link from what Esther's just said. So, um, and I love looms because it's it's the, you know, it, it's such a tactile physical thing that, you know, has been used most often by women, but not always. And I just love that kind of connection back there. That's fantastic. So we've got a couple of questions that have come in. We've got um, in fact three questions. We've got one from Wanda. Um, how do you know how much the coast has eroded and changed? Um, so if we take that one, then we've got another couple after that. Um, so do you want me to take that one? Since, yeah, uh, um, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, it's actually Orkley's had a lot more research on this specifically Shetland hasn't actually had anyone sitting down and doing finite coastal change research like Caroline Wickham Jones has done in Orkney um, a lot of the ways we can see it is very very physical and this is um, why we started working in Moda Dye we started working with uh, climate change as well and, and indicators of climate change because we realised that what we were seeing was things like um, boat noose, which is like a, a, an unroofed boat shed that were built in living memory. And now we're eroding off the coast edge with the way the sea level had changed and the sea patterns and storm surges have changed. Um, I think the most obvious way to see it in Shetland, to be honest, is, is literally just the archaeology eroding out, or awfully similar. Things that were obviously well inland um, when they were built. Um, are now eroding out of the edge of our coast, like a brock, for instance. Mm. You don't you don't build a brock on the beach, mm. um, and so we're tending to get it marked that way. Um, and there, there hasn't been any significant modelling done to give us exact, but we're definitely seeing archaeology on the beach that 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 shouldn't be, and really recent archaeology as well, um, like boat news and things that might have been built within within living memory um, are eroding out of coast edges. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, we've then got a question from Sylvia. Um, do you have any evidence of connection by the Western Seaways to Wales, Isle of Man, Cornwall and Brittany? Not in my time period. I don't know whether Mark can, not in, not in um, archaeological terms. Mm -hmm. No, the connection always seems to be Scottish, but Mark might be to answer for some of the later stuff. Mark? Yeah. Um... I suppose modern times, yes, but not not back in history. Western Isles, definitely. There were raiding parties that came to Shetland, um, as I'm sure you know, um, in the in the 15th and 16th century, um, to Dunrossness. I can't remember what the battle was called, but there was a battle down there. Um, but from Ireland and other, uh, well, apart, I guess. I suppose thinking about it, we don't know where the papa came from, uh, do we, Esther? No, um, I mean a lot of a lot of the, the pits in particular are, are quite mysterious in, in whether whatever kind of geographic region we're in. So no, we, we we're not actually sure. I mean, there's certainly a strong Pictish tradition down that coast, but um no we don't know the only things we can say in terms of the way things moved uh, the way things altered um stylistically and typologically all tends to connect orkney case and s the, the the northern scottish connection that you would you would sort of expect um because it's a lot closer um until you get into into connections with scandinavia um there's an interesting uh, Irish connection with Norway, mind you, uh, with Donegal particularly, in that they imported timber from Norway and they also imported boats from Norway to Donegal. Uh, and um, they've got a boat type in Donegal called uh, the Drontheim, um, which I think was imported from Trondheim originally. I might be wrong, but I think that's right. Um, so that, that's a connection there with Western Norway. And I suppose actually, 
rather than connections with Shetland, because you think, why would people come to mm. Shetland, particularly um, in terms of trade? We, the only thing we had to trade in Shetland was fish, to be brutally honest, butter, oil, fish oil, and wadmel. Um, mm. uh, whereas with Norway, uh, they've got resources of timber. So, yeah. And I guess with, with Donegal, mm. you know, there'd be trading connections with Scotland, with mainland Scotland. Mm. Um, so I think we were often a, a sort of port en route rather than necessarily yeah. a destination. So yeah. I suspect we were getting people coming in. I mean, I would say there's very, other than the Papa link, um, there's very little place name evidence that goes west. As, mm -hmm. And yeah. there's no, there, there's literally, I think there's what tends to be suggested. There's certainly a very, very small, maybe one or two Shetland dialect words that, that come from the Gaelic. Um, mm -hmm. There's really no kind of connection with that Western coast um, in the in the place names of the language. Um, it's all looking Scandinavian mainly. Um, but I guess, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, there is a suggestion that the Viking or early Norse towns such as Dublin might have had mm -hmm. sort of exports of fish and things. But that's still, as far as I know, um, kind of hypothetical. I don't think anyone's mm -hmm. got any absolute... Um, evidence to, to prove that it's just a suggestion that, mm -hmm. that it was coming out into that trade route yeah I mean the only other thing that I was just sort of thinking was sort of worth putting in potentially is also obviously what's in the Orkney Inga saga where you've got the sort of the, the tales of, of, of the travels and the, and the movement between particularly um, obviously Orkney, Shetland but across to the Isle of Man down to Ireland as well so you've got the tales in the sagas as well which I think is some evidence um, and, and that, that's, that's a good point yeah yeah yep. Um, yep. 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 um, yeah it's this is the trouble with the archaeology you just don't like all of this may have been happening <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But you just, unless it appears in site types or in the typology of something, you're not actually mm -hmm. seeing it. Um, yeah. But so I'm sure there were, I mean, in, in keeping with our entire talk, really, I'm sure there probably was more connectivity than we're seeing. Yeah. But, it's hard to think um, that there wouldn't have been connectivity given exactly the point of your talk, isn't it? The sea effectively yeah. being the, the easiest and the most straightforward form of transport and, um, and, and them being such fantastic seafarers as well with those amazing boats that that we've seen so make I mean, it so interesting things, archaeology is always more questions than answers it always is and one of the things that you do of course get in shetland is such a strong norse stamp mm. that if this kind of contact predated norse mm -hmm. then you you may not be seeing it because we, we we have very very few pre-norse place names mm -hmm. so <laughs> really they could have been anything um yeah. pre that period and we're just seeing it Again, it's a massive debate as to whether they what was wiped out, uh, whether mm. it was people or culture or language or whatever. But whatever happened and why ever it happened, you just see a sort of a, a, certainly a language eradication um, and and a very strong DNA replacement. Um, yeah. So so I think pre Norse contact might be quite hard to spot. Super, thank you. Well, we've got another couple of questions. Um, the first one is from IS uh, or IS and says an ancestor of mine from Southern Shetland married early 1800s is listed as a seaman. Any idea what he might have been doing? What sort of boats? Wow. Um, early 1800s seaman. He could have been he could have been pressed into the Royal Navy. Mm -hmm. um, press gangs, you know, impressment into the Navy was large in Shetland. <clears throat> the thing with with Shet the Shetlanders that they were renowned small boat seafarers, and so were, you know, the navy wanted them basically. Mm -hmm. So there, there's lots of records of um, naval ships coming up here to press men into service, mm -hmm. um, and when a ship was spotted on the horizon, there were plenty of places for for men to go and hide. Yeah, because uh, obviously the last thing you wanted was to be impressed mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. into the Royal Navy. Um, so that could be one option, could have been in the Royal Navy as a seaman. Um, early 1800s could have been going to the Greenland whaling, um, mm. that would be another option. Uh, he could have just been a mercantile seaman, he could have been mercantile marine, you know, um, on, a, on a trading ship. Um, and as many Shetlanders were, uh, majority of Shetland men were, if they could, I was talking to someone 
I was at a meeting last night and we were talking uh, and actually if you could you'd get away from the half fishing from the deep sea fishing which was mm. incredibly dangerous mm. um, not very well paid um, uh, and basically in Shetland um, there was a system of trucks so you're pretty much um, you didn't have much choice or freedom so if you could get away and get away to sea then that would be a good option for you Mm -hmm. um but not the royal navy i mean the royal navy royal navy wasn't i think at one stage was it three thousand men in shetland were enrolled were in in the royal mm -hmm. navy in the early 1800s well probably something like possibly well something like that just in terms of the odds and the numbers yeah but a very interesting bit of history definitely um got a question here from julie so what are the differences between an orkney yole and a shetland yole and do you think roads were so late coming to Shetland due to the amount and regular use of boats? That's a good question, actually. There's a big difference between a Shetland yawl and an Orkney yawl. They, they I haven't got a picture to show you, actually, but they look completely different. Um, completely different. And so, uh, you know, originally boats, the same boats were coming to Shetland as they were going to Orkney, but uh, mm -hmm. boat culture in Orkney went one way and boat culture in Shetland went a slightly different way. Um, so they diverged. Um, I've got the second part of the question, Julie, what was that? Do you think roads were so late coming to Shetland due to the amount and regular use of boats? Partly, yes. Um, if you walk around Shetland, you'll find lots of crafts that are a long way from a road, um, abandoned oh. crafts, lots and lots of them. I don't know if that's the same in Orkney, but certainly in Shetland um, there's lots of places you could only and you can only get to now really either by walking or by going by sea. Mm -hmm. And also uh, a lot of the most fertile land on Shetland is the low like uh, but like I mean the same applies with Shetland and Orkney but so much more of Shetland is Highland than, than mm -hmm. Orkney so the pockets mm -hmm. of lowland good fertile lowland um, mm -hmm grazing and an and arable land or, or it actually makes they're quite a lot of the old crofts as mark says they look incredibly inaccessible today until you realize mm. that they're all connected by the sea and it mm. didn't matter that you couldn't get to them by road because so, a lot of them i mean there's a few i've got in my mind some eyes i'm thinking have almost precipitous slopes behind them where you would never try and access and they're often abandoned now because accessing by, by road no one's even bothered to stay there once roads were they but when by seeing that they're, they're really easily interconnected with with towns and with other other crafts and and there's shops also there were shops on the shoreline with no settlement with them because they were all you people were just rowing to the shop yeah. it was just on the head of a beach um so it just yeah i think they probably were definitely um driven by that and also the terrain isn't great for road building in Shetland like it's you know it is steep mm. it is heathery it is peaty it's it, boats were by far an, an easier option it's not mm. a very hospitable place to put roads through no uh, uh, and you know walking particularly in winter time in Shetland I mean even now if you go um walking I mean up around Vidland around there trying to walk um in mm. quite deep heather it's not easy and the, like the Gunnister Man, Esther, you know, people, people went, went walking and never was seen again. Never came back. <laughs> that was, that was yeah, that. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a story, I think you were maybe with me, Mark, that the nesting, when we were with the nesting history group and they were telling the story about a lady, I can't remember the exact details in terms of date, but she was 19th century if some, and who went missing um, carrying potatoes and the only way they found her the next year was when they saw the potato patch growing yeah. because she'd gone into deep heather and they saw the potato mm -hmm. plants coming up you know and that was the only way they ever managed to find them because there is yeah it's not the most hospitable place to try and traverse without roads um and obviously yeah the weather's not great the heather's thick and um mm -hmm. so i can imagine why boats were just by far a way an easier way to get about yeah. mm -hmm. um, and, then, and i think roads roads came in when things started to get more formalized as well and then yeah. they were starting to try and move produce around and move things around in a different way mm -hmm. it was actually a famine wasn't it it's was famine relief the first roads were being built Estrella, a lot yeah. of the meal rates yeah yeah they were put in as as they were in a lot of places they were put in as a form of famine relief in the 19th century um 
and um and you can still find it in the name somewhere with the, mm. the meal roads but um yeah and so they were they were sort of job creation at that stage um okay. mm. and then and then it became once there was a road then people would start to use it but then mm. um i mean the stories even there was an in the shetland times a few years ago there was a lady i think she by the time she was talking to them in the shuttle time she was in her 90s and she remembered coming through from Samus which is on the absolute west mainland of Shetland um through to Lerwick and it would they would have to come for three days because they they were on foot and they, mm. they could get a lift sort of hitch part of it by cart and then walk parts of it and then they had to get boats because there's bridges now across bows that were there so they would have to get ferry that small ferries across the bays and it would it would be a three-day round trip once a month um mm -hmm. when she was a child and that was that was only in the that was in the 20th century um yeah it's living memory quite, yeah yeah it's living memory and so by boat it would have been it would have been a lot easier um although Sanus, to be honest even by boat is a little bit remote mm -hmm. if you were trying to get to the it because it is right mm -hmm. out of the west mainland but mm -hmm. yeah 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 so i think boat was just much quicker and easier. Ashen, thank you. That tale about the lady with the potatoes is absolutely brilliant. I and mean, I can imagine that turning up in some sort of, I don't know, crime series based in Shetland, who knows, at some point <laughs> in the future. Yeah, that'll be their new theme. That'll be, I'll yeah, be my idea. Yeah, exactly. How did you know there was a body there? Well, there was some tatties. <laughs> it was the tatties were coming up. Yeah. Well, it was a tatty it's, fact, it's, Yeah, if there's any researchers watching this, this will, this will be popping yeah, yeah, up. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You, you <laughs> can have that idea. It's fantastic. Mm -hmm. brilliant well thank you i think that's it for questions we've got in the chat so just i guess a, a final call out if there's any more questions that anybody has if anybody wants to ask a question or um put a question in the chat not seeing any so while well, we're giving brilliant. you a chance i've just realized mark's forgotten to plug his book oh, oh yeah for goodness sake yeah. mark come on <laughs> really forgot. basic author 101 there <laughs> <laughs> yeah Hopefully, I've just given the first proof back to the publisher, and there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. But um, there was a publishing date of uh, the end of November. Um, I think it's probably going to slip a bit. Uh, the title, uh, which I did write down earlier, actually, because I keep forgetting the title, which is stupid to get a brain freeze. It's Shetland's Boats, Origin, Evolution and Use. And it's been published through the Shetland Times. Uh, and will be available online as well through the Shetland Times uh, website or through bookshop.org. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. yeah. Well, what we'll do, Mark, when we've got details of that, we'll pop it up on our uh, Facebook page and Twitter account and all the rest of it and do all the usual stuff just to push that out because I know that um, obviously we've had a lot of interest in this talk and I know that members of our society will be super interested in that as well. So we'll We'll definitely do that and maybe maybe even suggest at some point doing a talk on the book so that would be brilliant if you could do that for oh, us at some point we would yeah, love that thank you very brilliant. much right so there's one last question we'll take this as the last question from david lynn saying assuming caring ownership how long can boats last well uh as we've seen from some of the the boats um on display in the viking ship museum uh, which were buried um, mm. and the Nydam ship that was found in Jutland in Denmark um, you know uh, they can survive a very long time mm -hmm. uh, given the right conditions and it's kind of ironic actually that some boats in museums start to deteriorate because of the um, mm. you know the, the um, too much or too little humidity um, and the Viking Ship Museum in Oslo are having a new extension built, which will be um, climate controlled uh, to try and preserve the boats because they're starting to fall to bits. Um, so, yeah, I mean, a boat can last centuries. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I guess yeah. if but it's, it's in like use, a broom, it's like a broom, you know. That's exactly what I was going to say. It's like <laughs> grandfather's axe, isn't it? You'll just try to yeah. replace it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I see it only falls and horses with trigger. Oh, yeah, this yeah, is yeah. my grandfather's broom. It's yeah, only had yeah. three new handles and four new heads. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I guess that'll be the main change, wouldn't it, Mark? It could probably carry on for hundreds of years if you looked after it well, but it eventually wouldn't be quite the same boat. No, yeah. exactly. And a lot of boats are not the same boat, you know, um, mm -hmm. because every time you repair them, they change slightly. Um, so, yeah, over time. Uh, that's why when you find a boat that's completely unique and original, 
it mm-hmm. is a big find. Uh, and mm-hmm. that boat I talked about earlier on that Tommy Eisbister owned, he's now donated it to the Shetland Museum. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's brilliant because that is a really important artifact. Um, so yeah, hope that's on your question. And if you're interested in boat restoration, uh, yeah, give us a, give us a follow. I mean, give us if you're interested in what we do, give us a follow on social media anywhere. Mm-hmm. Boat to die. But we've been following Mark's last three years restoring out. Is it 1949? Yeah, your, it's 1949. Your boat? Fourine, yeah, girl Chrissy. Um, so so there's there's photos right through our mainly Instagram and Facebook. Uh, well, I think on all of them, um, uh, about that. We we. So yeah, if anyone does think of a burning question after this, feel free to get in touch with us either through the website, which mm-hmm. is just modadie.org, or through modadie on like Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just give us a shout, and we're quite happy Super. to answer. Yeah, great. Well, we'll also again, we'll put those links up in our Facebook and our Twitter as well and share those out because I think what's been brilliant about this, and first of all, just to say formal thank you to um, to Esther and to Mark for the time this evening. And, you know, we were really, really keen to have um, have you speak because it's the links between Shetland and Orkney and also, of course, more wider than that. It's really important. And I'm reminded that, Mark, when you talk about um, Mr. Eisbister and his and his boat, because Eisbister is a, is a really common Orkney name as well. So you've got that sort of those links are always there and our two communities are separated by sea only but we're in many ways so similar and so connected and I think it's great that we can do that so thanks so much to you for being part of Brocktoberfest it's been a brilliant talk and um, just before we finish what I want to do is just to say that we have one more final event and that's on Sunday night and that's an event hosted by the Caithness Brock Project um, with uh, Kenny McElroy as the quiz master so it's a Brock quiz um, we have a number of tickets for that left. Again, it's book, on, book your tickets on Eventbrite um, if you're interested in coming along to that. I, I believe there's no prizes apart from the fact that the, the honour of winning obviously will be enough for whichever lucky team does that. And if people know Kenny from the Caithness Brock project, you can guarantee it'll be an entertaining evening, probably with lots of Caithness Brocks in it. But we'll, you know, we'll, we'll allow them that. Um, and we'll, we'll obviously take our own in as well. So just want to say thank you very much to everybody. This is the last formal talk of this year's Brocktoberfest. So I think it should also worth just thanking um, the members of the Orkney Archaeology Society Board who've helped organise this event. Um, It's the first time we've done it for longer than a weekend and I think it's been absolutely brilliant. All the talks are now up on our YouTube channel or that this one will be up on our YouTube channel shortly. And uh, just say thank you very much and we'll see hopefully you all again in 2022 when we do Brocktoberfest for that but other than that thank you very much and have a fantastic evening everybody and thanks so much for joining us and especially Esther and Mark thank you thank you very much Hayley thank you thank you very much for inviting us yeah yeah it's been brilliant to have you thank you take care bye everybody good night thank you good night